pranam and welcome. Our subject today is introspection, a key topic in the Kriya Yoga teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. My name is Brother Govindananda and I'm speaking to you today from the main chapel of SRF's international headquarters in the Mount Washington neighborhood of Los Angeles. And wherever you are watching or listening from today, I hope that you are doing well and staying safe, even as this pandemic seems to go on and on around us. So as always, we begin our service with a period of chanting and meditation. And if you don't have meditation techniques, it's still worth joining us for this meditation period. You can just sit there talking to God in the language of your heart and soul, allowing the mind to quieten down, to become calm, to get a sense of who we are beneath the surface activities of our mind and emotions, and perhaps to start to feel and to hear the presence and voice of God within us. So now we'll have our chant and meditation. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Heavenly Father, we will reason, we will will, and we will act, but guide thou our reason, will, and activity to the right thing that we should do. Om, peace, Amen. So let's take a moment to check our posture before the meditation. Sit erect, yet relaxed, spine away from the back of the chair. And keep the hands with palms upturned at the juncture of the thighs and abdomen. And this position here helps to stop the body from leaning forward as we meditate. And then close your eyes and gently lift the eyes to the point between the eyebrows, the spiritual eye. This point, it's between the eyebrows and a little above the eyebrows. This should be a relaxed position. Imagine or feel as if you are looking out through that point in the forehead. The spiritual eye is the doorway to the higher states of spiritual consciousness within us. And during meditation, it's good to check from time to time that our eyes have not lowered, because when they lower, then the thoughts tend to come rushing back in. So keep the eyes lifted. But again, do it in a relaxed fashion. You can check the body for tension. If you feel that there is particular tension in any part, tense that body part still higher, a little bit higher. Then relax, let go. And check the entire body in this way. Because physical tension keeps our attention and consciousness on the outside. And we want to allow those to withdraw within, which is where we will feel the presence of God. Our chant this morning is the dawn chant. Night has flown, dawn has come. Wake, my children, wake. Wake, my children, wake. Sitting in the asana of meditation. Sitting in the asana of meditation. Think ye of thy Guru's lotus feet. Think ye of thy Guru's lotus feet. Night has flown, dawn has come. Wake, my children, wake. 
Wake, my children, wake, sitting in the asana of meditation, sitting in the asana of meditation, think ye of thy Guru's lotus feet, think ye of thy Guru's lotus feet, night has flown, dawn has come, wake, my children, wake, Wake, my children, wake, sitting in the asana of meditation, sitting in the asana of meditation. Think ye of thy Guru's lotus feet, think ye of thy Guru's lotus feet. Night has flown, dawn has come. Wake, my children, wake, wake, my children, wake. Sitting in the asana of meditation, sitting in the asana of meditation, think ye of thy Guru's lotus feet, think ye of thy Guru's lotus feet. Night has flown, dawn has come. Wake, my children, wake, wake, my children, wake. Sitting in the asana of meditation, sitting in the asana of meditation, think ye of thy Guru's lotus feet, think ye of thy Guru's lotus feet, oh, think ye of thy Guru's lotus feet.
So, introspection. Introspection, I think, it's like that good friend that doesn't hesitate to tell us when, we're, when we need to hear something that we might not want to hear. But we can hear it from a good friend because we know they've always got our back. And it's much easier to hear what, what the world has to tell us through our friend than from the world itself. You would think introspection would be an easy thing to embrace because of this, but it's really not. We have to get over that initial hurdle, that initial reluctance to, to get into introspection. And it's well worth doing it because even though there are good reasons for the reluctance to introspect, there are even better reasons to embrace it. And when we really get into introspection and when we really see what it can do for us, we can find that introspection is actually exhilarating. Introspection is so important that the Bhagavad Gita begins and ends with the character Sanjaya speaking. And Sanjaya, as most of us know, represents introspection. And his name is, is very revealing as to the importance of introspection. It means complete victory, complete victory. And that's what introspection can enable us to, to achieve on the spiritual path complete victory. So, why can introspection be difficult? On a spiritual level, I think it's pretty simple. The ego doesn't want to hear about it, but it's very valuable to also think how this plays out on an emotional and even a physical level. Because introspection can be uncomfortable and can even engender physically uncomfortable feelings, that we instinctively want to get away from them. We all have certain identities, certain ideas about ourselves in daily life. There are the obvious ones, like whether we're a man or a woman, maybe a husband or wife or single, maybe American or Brazilian or Indian, whatever it is. I mean, this is our identity in daily life. And we probably also think of ourselves as fundamentally good people, I think, intelligent people probably, and kind people most likely. Whereas introspection, of course, is actively looking for evidence to the contrary. Maybe not necessarily to the contrary, but evidence about how we maybe don't come quite up to the mark that we might think we're coming up to, and, and to look for ways to do better. David DeSalvo, in his book, what makes your brain happy and why you should do the opposite, talks about how this works in the body and mind. And, and it's really very interesting. And again, we could just look at this on, on a very high spiritual level, but it's important to really consider what goes on because when, when the idea of introspection comes up. Because if we don't do that, the ego will just say, you know, let's not do it. And we're not even aware that we've made that decision. De Salvo points to a study that was done in 2005 that shows how the brain craves a certain certainty about everything that happens. And if that certainty isn't there, things start to go off very quickly. And he actually says that we can see that when we introduce ambiguity into a situation, we start to see more activity in the amygdala these two structures in the brain that tend to activate when we feel threatened, when there's something uh, in the environment that we, we should look out for. And not only that, he says the activity in another part of the brain, the reward center, tends to go down. And this all happens by just introducing ambiguity to the experience of the test subjects. So you think about what this means for, for when we try to sit down to introspect. We are introducing a certain ambiguity into our feelings about who we are. And this is inherently uncomfortable. It's inherently uncomfortable. And the best way to avoid this discomfort is to simply not introspect in the first place. 
which we quickly decide to do if we're not conscious about what is happening. We'll come back to this, this point about the need to be certain later, because it, it's, it speaks a lot, I think, to what is going on in the world today. But to summarize, what, we're, what we've looked at is that the soul might want to say, just do it, when it comes to introspection, but the ego, and as it manifests in the body and mind, tends to say, just don't do it. So, FOI, fear of introspection, it's a thing. So what do we do about it? Paramahansa Yogananda said that after meditation in the evening is the best time to introspect because the intuitive faculty is most alive after meditation and because in the evening we can review the day. But most importantly for what concerns us right now, spiritual intuition comes from the soul. And when we are in that soul consciousness, to whatever degree, the discomfort we might feel at other times in thinking about our flaws is greatly reduced, even non-existent, because we have gained distance from those flaws. We have established ourselves, to whatever degree, in soul consciousness. By way of analogy, we don't usually get as stressed if another person is being reprimanded in the room. Unless, of course, we identify with or are related to that other person in some way. But it gets better. Not only can a soul perspective make it easier to introspect, it can also allow some of the things that make us afraid to introspect in the first place just fall away. Does that sound too good to be true? Some years ago, we published excerpts from the book Flawless by Louis Tartaglia, MD, in our magazine. This was a few years ago now. Dr. Tartaglia had been a practicing psychiatrist for, psychiatrist for more than 20 years when he published his book. And what he has to say about the power of a soul perspective is worth quoting at length. And again, especially in this case, because he was a psychiatrist. You know, it's worth having his perspective because we're currently talking about how to overcome any reluctance to introspect. And one of the excuses the ego will roll out on our behalf is the excuse, this will work for someone that has soul awareness, but it doesn't really apply to me, because I'm not there yet. Paramahansa Yogananda probably had to deal with this uh, objection from his students and disciples all the time. We're told the story in the book Sayings of Paramahansa Yogananda that the master was trying to encourage a student by telling him that the Lord is not distant, but near. I see him everywhere. And the student responded somewhat famously for SRF members, but sir, you are a master. In my memory, in my mind, when I was thinking of the story, I, I seemed to remember that Master had responded, how do you think I became a Master? But that's actually not what he said. That's probably what, I would, <laughs> probably what I would have said. Instead, he said, all souls are equal. The only difference between you and me is that I made the effort. I showed God that I love him, and he came to me. Love is the magnet from which God cannot escape. In other words, the things I tell you to do are the things that I did to become a master in the first place. They work for everyone, no matter what stage of spiritual progress you're at. And so back to Dr. Tartaglia. He said that most of his colleagues would probably tell you that it takes years of hard work and therapy to make profound changes in your personality, and that it is not possible to make changes in the character. That's, you know, commonly believed in that profession. But he said, don't you believe that for a moment? And he himself said he had witnessed what, what would be termed miraculous transformations of character in his patients if they put in the effort to change in the right way. And he felt the key to profound transformation is simply a willingness to change, what he called a kind of humility. One thing he did was simply talk his patients through a certain thought process that enabled them to get a certain distance from the things that were going on in their lives. 
and from their troubles. He would get them to acknowledge, for example, through simply thinking about it, that they are not their body. You know, he'd ask them, you know, who are you? Are you your, are you your body? They would have to admit, no, because they could sense, could experience that distance between their thinking, their experiencing essence, and the body. And similarly, he asked them, are you your thoughts? And again, they'd have to say the same thing, no. Are you your feelings? No, same reason. Are you your sensations? No. Are you the things you've done? No. And through simply getting them to acknowledge and answer each of these questions along the way, he brought them to a state of being aware of who they then truly were. Now, some people have tough lives, and unfortunately, some of us have, have very tough lives. And Dr. Tartaglia told the story of one particular woman who definitely fell into this latter category. And he said, I asked her, who are you really? What is your spiritual core made of? And he told her, I, you know, I can't answer for you. You need to answer. And he pointed out, she was not the words she spoke, the things she did, the feelings or thoughts either. And he, he, he walked her through this process. And then, seemingly all of, all of a sudden, the realization hit home for her. And to quote Tartaglia, she had discovered that her true identity, her spiritual core, had been flawless the whole time. She had realized who or what she really was. And he said, a power awoke that evening in someone who had never known spiritual power. She was free, liberated by the knowledge of who she was. She had touched upon her flawless self. She didn't have to forgive and forget. She had tried that for years. The moment she realized her flawless self, she became forgiveness. She knew her spiritual core was blameless, just the witness. Dr. Tartaglia concluded his story by saying, Here is a secret. When you are entirely ready to release character flaws, they get removed. That's right. At first they lose their attraction. Later they get pulled by the grace of God. This is a psychiatrist. I don't have any better explanation for it. Even if I could invent a psychological explanation for it, I wouldn't bother. I have seen it happen too often to know that explaining willingness doesn't really make willingness happen. But all it requires is, as Tartaglia called it, a certain kind of humility. So finally, we're ready to introspect, or almost ready. And you might have noticed I have failed entirely to give a definition of introspection up to this point, so maybe we should do that now. Paramahansa Yogananda defined introspection as follows. He called it a mirror, a mirror in which to see recesses of your mind that otherwise would remain hidden from you. Diagnose your failures and sort out your good and bad tendencies. Analyze what you are, what you wish to become, and what shortcomings are impeding you. So what's the best way to do this? We've already talked about the best time to introspect, and that's after our meditation in the evening. But is there a particular method, or a certain way to sort out these good and bad tendencies that works better than all the others? One of our monks told me about the time he was meeting with another few monks in Sri Dayamata's office, and the discussion turned to the subject of introspection. And one of the monks, you know, he was very excited because he he said, oh Ma, I have this, I have this chart, you see, it's got, it's got all these, these things that I'm tracking. You know, what I'm doing in the mornings, what I'm doing in the afternoons, what I'm doing in the evenings, and how what I do in the morning affects how I feel and behave in the afternoon. And, and you know, he was like really excited about this. It seemed quite complicated. And uh, Ma said, um, if that works for you, that's great. If that works for you, that's great. But do you know the best way to introspect? And they all looked at her. And she said, after your evening meditation, after you've practiced Kriya Yoga and become peaceful and become calm, 
that is when you introspect. Because that is when your soul can speak to you, and that is when you can hear what it has to say. The thing about charts, as good as they are, is that if we're just, if we have just created them out of a superficial analysis of what we need to work on, then it's very easy for the ego to come in and say, you know, hey, wouldn't it be great if you could do this and if you learned that, and, and, and then this other thing. I mean, you know, how many hundreds of things could we potentially be working on at any one time? It's, it's overwhelming. But the ego will quite happily have us work on a whole bunch of things that don't really get to the heart, perhaps, of what we uh, uh, could be working on that would help us make the greatest spiritual progress in the shortest amount of time. But if we have meditated first and got that intuitive sense of what we need to work on, then charts and the like can really be helpful. Now let's talk about where spiritual study fits in, because you might have noticed that whenever Paramahansa Yogananda or his disciples talked about introspection, they also talked about spiritual study virtually in the same breath. Patanjali's list of positive prescriptions, as they're known, the, the niyamas, includes svadhyaya, which is variously translated as self-analysis or introspection, or introspective study of the scriptures, or repetition of scripture to oneself. You know, it's got many different translations. And what the ex existence of these multiple translations really mean is that spiritual study done right is a powerful means for self-analysis and introspection. Well, Next question always is, well, what does done right really mean? Well, suppose I asked you, what is your mindset when you sit down to study spiritual writings or scripture, if you like? Do you think of them as something that helps you become who you really are or as something that helps you change yourself into something or someone that you are not at the moment. Again, is it helping you become who you really are, or is it helping you ch to change yourself into something else entirely, so to speak? Well, I think that if, if, if we think it's to help us become some, someone that we are not already, then that will never happen. At some point, we will have to mentally switch over and realize, oh, these things that Yogananda is describing in his writings, the, the soul, the spirit, this is who I am. This is not just who I will become at some point in the future. No, this is who I am right now. I just need to improve my awareness of that truth. And this is a, I mean, can you see the entirely different approach? There, these are two entirely different approaches. And the success depends on which, which way we approach uh, scriptural, spiritual study. I received the following anonymous testimonial once. It, it perfectly describes the right approach to spiritual study. And it not only describes the, the, the best approach, it describes the incredible power of spiritual study. The author, an SRF member, wrote of their experience with, you know, let's call it some uh, generic guided imagery. How it had helped, how this generic guided imagery had helped with, again, this was one of these devotees that had had a very tough life. And I don't know whether it was a he or a she, but they had uh, used this guided imagery to help them address and overcome their issues. But it hadn't been enough to really lead for the longed-for breakthrough, the sense of like leaving the past behind. But then this devotee found the power of spiritual study, and they wrote to me. Again, anonymous. I didn't realize at first how much Master's writing served as my imagery in my healing process. I rarely used imagery tapes. 
The ones I had heard were nice, but too lightweight to have much impact on the amount of trauma I had been dealing with. But Master, promising we can have God in this life and describing what that is like? And he does it over and over, using every conceivable imagery. All his words are powerful images. For example, to feel God in every fiber of our being. You know, just, just think about that. To, to feel God in every fiber of our being. In every wisp of thought. They incorporate both an image and a feeling. Add will, wanting and willing it with all your heart, and it makes the images and feelings stronger still. Even though in the beginning my mind was too compromised to fully take in what Master was saying, just reading it made inroads. Replacing old trauma thoughts with God thoughts, contact with Master's divine consciousness. As Master said, Bring in the light and the darkness will vanish. Powerful testimonial to, to spiritual study done right. Dr. Tartaglia had a list of what he called the, the top ten character flaws and, and seven attributes or marks of character. And for Dr. Tartaglia, character is the expression of the soul's true nature. And it's interesting to, I'm going to read through these lists, even though reading lists is, is dangerous, because these lists could have been written yesterday with, when you see what's going on in the world. And they may be flaws that we might not otherwise realize that they really are flaws. I was visiting my parents in Ireland once some years back. We were watching a comedy movie on television and uh, during one scene, the lead actor, who I won't name, he was just acting outrageously. And the thing was, I recognized one of my own mental traits in his behavior. And, you know, it was the classic shock of recognition. And I think my jaw might have actually dropped open. And, uh, I, you know, I just turned to my mother and said, oh my, that's me. And uh, she didn't, she didn't disagree, actually. And uh, again, I would not have, had, had, I, had that not been held up to me as a mirror, I would not have stopped to think that, you know, this is a real, this is not a good way to be thinking about things. So, Dr. Tartaglia's list of t 10 top uh, flaws. And he said, in all his years of treating patients, these are the ones that occurred most frequently. Number one, addicted to being right. And remember, we talked earlier that Di Salvo points out that now we can see through brain scanning and what have you, that this addiction to, feel right, to, to, to being right is a deep craving for certainty in the brain. We, the brain wants to feel certain about things. It wants to feel sure of itself, of its place in the world, and wants to be sure about what's going on in the world. You know, something that seems to be, you know, let's face it, particularly difficult to come by these days. And there are physiological reasons for it. Addicted to being right. The second one is raging indignation. And again, as bad as this might have been 20 years ago, you'd wonder how much worse it might be these days. You would, you would think raging indignation would be, would be uh, something that people would like really recoil from. It, it's, it's not a, a comfortable state to be in. And yet, it, when you look at what's happening, sometimes you think, do, do people actually, it looks like they're actually enjoying this. You know, the, it's like it gives them a sense of feeling powerful uh, in, in a world where they perhaps are not feeling that powerful at all. And back in the 60s, uh, scientists who were trying to treat severe epilepsy had put uh, electrodes into different places in the brain and allowed the, the epileptic patients to press the lever. They gave them control over how many electrical pulses they would push into their brain in different places. And they put these electrodes, depending on the particular patient, in different centers like the reward centers like we talked about earlier, or the so-called pleasure centers, or, or, or centers that elicited a feeling of 
anger and hostility in some cases, depending on, again, where the focal point of the epilepsy was. And amazingly, at least one patient decided to press that buzzer most often not for the pleasure center, but for the center that evoked a sense of anger and hostility. And uh, Andrew Huberman, who's a neuroscientist at Stanford, he posits that this reveals a fundamental truth about human nature. There's something about us that likes that sense of, it gives us a sense of energy. And he said he, he doesn't think that we need to uh, understand much further why social media is as powerful as it is these days. Now, of course, not all social media is bad. It depends how we use it. But we begin to see why certain people, maybe many of us, can be drawn to things that just create these feelings in us and objectively we think, why would we do that? Well, again, there are deep reasons for, the, for, for everything we do. The, the uh, third character flaw, fixing blame and nurturing resentments. The fourth one, the dread seekers, so-called worry and fear. The fifth one is intolerance. Number six, the poor me or martyr syndrome. Number seven is self-regard run riot. I think Dr. Tartaglia had the sense of humor. Number eight is the excuse for everything, inadequacy. Number nine is hypercritical fault finding. And number 10 is chronic dishonesty. Now, how did you do? I'll tell you, I am not going to give you my score. I am going to keep that to myself. Yeah. But even if you saw yourself in many of these flaws, not to worry. Paramahansa Yogananda and all his great disciples emphasized that we are never to dwell on our flaws. And Dr. Tartaglia echoed that from his perspective as a psychiatrist. He said, if you have identified one of them as your own, don't focus too hard on it. Start exploring the wholesome quality that could replace it and make your life better. This is, this is exactly what Patanjali says in his Yoga Sutras. Focus on the opposite. Just dwelling on the problem just makes it worse. And what I like about this list is that it predominantly highlights those useless but tempting habits of thought that keep so many of us going around in circles. You know, you think about it, you know, we haven't gone out and done something bad to somebody. You know, these we think, well, I'm just going through this in my own mind. But, but these are the things that they seem so, they can seem so innocuous. But these are the things that are holding us back. On the plus side, or on the other side, you could say, uh, Dr. Tartaglia lists seven character marks, seven manifestations of the soul. And again, it's worth going through these. Surrender. He calls that the mark of greatness. Second one is honesty, and he calls that the mark of realism. And the third one is forgiveness. That's the mark of humility. And the fourth one is confidence, the mark of faith. I was a little surprised that he said confidence was the mark of faith, but when you think about it, real confidence, and even to, to look at the word, confidence with faith, real confidence comes from the soul. Tolerance, the mark of perfection. Tolerance, the mark of perfection. You know, who would, who would have thought it? Peacefulness, the mark of wisdom. And selfless service is the mark of love. So, marks out of seven? Well, let's give ourselves sevens all around. And why not? Because we, we all have these qualities to some degree. The only thing we need to do, perhaps, is to go deeper and deeper with some of these qualities make them manifest more fully within us. But never think we're starting from nowhere. We've probably already come a long way with each of these qualities. And these are soul qualities, so what that means is we're more in tune with our soul consciousness than, we're, than, than we might really be aware of. And there's further good news. Just by working to allow one of these qualities to express, the others express themselves also. And Dr. Tartaglia wrote, 
Your flawless self will express the wholesome qualities that make up your character. Just as the flaws cluster together, so do your virtues. Intolerance and vengeance show their ugly heads one after the other, but so do tolerance and forgiveness. All the virtues harmoniously work if you work on releasing just one of the flaws. So I think this is a scope for tremendous optimism. So now we, we, once we have the foundation of our introspective practice in place, there are many different things we can do to deepen that practice. I'd just like to talk about one of them today. And this was one that Sri Dayamata recommended to one of the monks in her office, some years ago now, of course. And it involves the use of a small mirror, which is a prop, you might remember, that the young Paramahansa Yogananda used to disabuse a so-called saint of some pretty um, wrong notions he had about himself. And uh, this story is told in the book Mejda, and it has many stories recounting Paramahansa Yogananda's early years when he was known as Mukunda Lal Ghosh. But on one occasion, our guru went to see this particular saint. He was billed as a saint, at least, and he was, you know, s sitting back, looking very important. And when he saw the young Mukunda come forward, he exclaimed in, loud, in a loud voice, I am God! And uh, <clears throat> Yogananda, of course, very quickly disabused him of that notion. And, and the, the saint did not take kindly to hearing this from a young boy at all, and he got really, really angry. And Yogananda took out a small mirror from his shoulder bag and he held it up to the saint and he said, look at this. Is that the face of God? Now what happened next was really nothing short of miraculous because the, the saint suddenly had, you know, this look of enlightenment came over him. And young Makunda had already turned to go away, but the saint came running after him and he said, young sir, young sir, please stop, please stop. You have awakened me from a great delusion today. I can't thank you enough. And Yoganandaji said that years later, this so-called saint really did become a very great saint. And it all started from that one moment of objectively looking at himself in a mirror. So back to the monk in Sri Dayamata's office. This monk had, had told Ma that there was a particular thing that he was really struggling with and uh, he tended to do a certain behavior before he realized what was going on, and then it was seemingly too late. And it was troubling him. And Ma said, I've got, I've got something that I think will help you. And so the next time they met, Ma took out a small mirror and gave it to this monk and said, every time you perform or you do this action, this habit that you want to stop doing, Take out this little mirror, so take, bring it with you everywhere you go, but take out this little mirror and look into it and say, yeah, there he is, he did it again. And uh, this monk said, oh, <laughs> uh, that won't be necessary. I mean, it was a sort of a mortifying thought that you know, every time he did, he did this action, he'd have to stop. Hopefully he's able to go away and not have to pull out the mirror in front of people, but pull out a mirror and, and, and look at yourself and, and be embarrassed into realizing really what you had just done. And uh, Ma said, no, you do this now. So he, of course, had no choice and he agreed to do it. And uh, after some time, he came back to Ma and he said, Ma, you wouldn't believe it. And of course she said, well, I probably would, but tell me what happened. And he said, every time I did that, and at first it was very difficult, but then I would pull out that mirror and I'd look at it and, I, and I'd say, yeah, there he is, he did it again. And very quickly, I began, I began to get a distance from what I had done. And just by giving myself that distance, I have found that the habit just, and, and, and by seeing objectively through the use of this mirror what I had done, and, and, and putting that distance between me and, and the action, then it just seems to have started to fall away and it's not, not a problem for me anymore. And Ma said, that's exactly why I wanted you to do this. It gave you the distance between that, um, between yourself, your true self, and that habit. 
So this is one thing we can do if there's something in the heat of battle, so to speak, uh, to really help us manifest the realizations that our introspection has perhaps given us um, after, after our evening meditations. Paramahansa Yogananda said, as soon as you learn to think introspectively, you change right then and there. You have dissociated yourself from your faults and recognized them instead of pretending they do not exist. In that instant, a change takes place. Even the desire to be good, to correct yourself, means you have changed. Now, not that of any of us don't want to introspect, but maybe you're wondering just how important it is, you know, whether someone, not us of course, but whether someone can maybe get by without it. So I couldn't find a, a study on this question, especially, not surprisingly, but maybe we can guess the answer by considering the studies by William Parker and Elaine St. John's that they recounted in their book, Prayer Can Change Your Life. And again, these, th this book was reviewed in our magazine quite a few years ago now. But they measured how effective prayer and psychotherapy were for the treatment of emotional disorders, both separately and together. So they divided their subjects into three groups. One, the control group, and in this case it was called the control group, received psychotherapy only. Let's say this group is the proxy for the introspective devotee. And the second group just prayed about their problem. Prayed in whatever way came naturally to them, that is. And this group can stand in for the devotee that chooses not to introspect. The third group received psychotherapy and also prayed. So what were the results? Uh, these are very interesting. In the prayer-only group, there was 0% zero, zero improvement. In the therapy-only group, there was 67% improvement. And in the third group, combined treatment of prayer plus psychotherapy, there was 72% improvement plus some dramatic cases of, of improvement. Now, this isn't to say, of course, that praying in the right way isn't tremendously helpful. It is. In fact, when you think about it, introspection and prayer done right are very close to each other. I mean, just think about what, what both of them really entail. But in these studies, however, the researchers found that those that were relying on prayer only were focusing on their problems exclusively, without any energy going to making an effort to manifest the opposing quality. So you can see how it all comes together. We first have to become aware of what our issues are, uh, while having a, a, a distance from them that is afforded to us by a soul perspective, and then we work on the opposite. And if we do that with a sense of humility, if we're fortunate, and this can happen, it happens all the time, these negative qualities can just fall away of themselves. So we've covered a few key points about introspection. We've acknowledged that it can be difficult to get started. We've looked at why that is so, because it can be a threat to how we like to think of ourselves, our self-image. We've looked at what to do about this. We introspect once we have established an intuitive connection between who we think we are and who we really are as the soul. Or we establish that connection through a rigorous mental analysis of who or what we are not. We're not our thoughts, we're not our, our behaviors, we're not our feelings, we're not our sensations. Well then who are we? or that awareness, that is soul awareness. And we've discussed how study of spiritual teachings done right can be a great help to establishing that soul perspective. And we've discussed one technique that we can use to help us in the heat of battle, to help us manifest our introspective insights, even in the heat of the day's activities. In the Bhagavad Gita, the individual spiritual seeker, and that's us, is represented by Arjuna, and the soul or spirit is represented by Krishna. And just as introspection can be difficult for us if we go about it in the wrong way, so it was not easy for Arjuna at the beginning to hear what Krishna had to say, and he actually refused point blank 
to, to do anything about it. He, re, he refused to engage. He refused to fight. And, and, and Krishna was, was, was very strong with him. He said, you're a coward. You're a coward. In Edwin Arlo's translation, Krishna tells Arjuna, cast off that coward fit. But as our introspective abilities develop, our experience of introspection changes accordingly, and it can become exhilarating. We look forward to it. At the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, Sanjaya seems to be little more than a neutral observer, a literary device, a character that recounts the day's events. Whereas at the end of the Gita, he is shown to be ecstatic at what he has observed and witnessed. The Gita ends with Sanjaya speaking, not to Dhritarashtra, the blind sense mind to whom he has been speaking throughout the Gita, but instead Sanjaya is now talking to Arjuna and to Krishna directly. And the Gita ends with these lines, O Archer Prince, all hail, O Krishna, Lord of Yoga, surely there shall not fail blessing and victory and power for thy most mighty sake, where this son comes of Arjun, and how with God he spake. It's, it's hard to think those lines, to read those lines, without getting a little bit emotional about it, because this is what awaits us all. This is, this is true introspection. This is self-realization. So now we're going to have our prayer service, and uh, we'll sit for a few minutes, pray for others, and then we'll do our healing service together. Jai Guru. So now let's take a few minutes to pray deeply for all those that have asked for healing prayers in body, mind, and soul. And please remember to pray also for peace and harmony in the world.
So now let's practice Paramahansa Yogananda's healing technique together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their bodies. Now rubbing the hands together, feeling the energy coming in through the medulla, gathering in the hands. And we lift our hands and send out that energy to all those that have asked for our healing prayers while chanting Om. Om. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their minds. Again, rotating the hands around each other, gathering that energy. Om. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in their souls. Once more, let us chant Om, sending vibrations of peace and harmony to all mankind. Om. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Divine Mother, may thy love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion, and may we be able to awaken thy love in all hearts. Om, peace, amen. May God and Guru bless you all.